the courtship of Miles Standish. In the old colony days in Plymouth, the land of the pilgrims, to and fro in a room of his simple and primitive dwelling, clad in doublet and hose and boots and cardivan leather, strode with a martial air, Miles Standish, the Puritan captain, buried in thought he seemed with his hands behind him and pausing. Ever anon, and behold his glittering weapons of warfare, hanging in shining array along the walls of the chamber, cutlass and corselet of steel and his trusty sword of Damascus, curved at the point and inscribed with its mystical Arabic sentence, while underneath in a corner were fowling piece, musket, and matchlock. Short of stature he was, but strongly built and athletic, broad in the shoulders, deep-chested with muscles, and sinews of iron, brown as a nut was his face, but his russet beard was already flaked with patches of snow as hedges sometimes in November. Near him was seated John Alden, his friend and household companion, riding with diligent speed at a table of pine by the window, fair-haired, azure-eyed, and with delicate Saxon complexion. Having the dew of his youth and the beauty of thereof, as the captives whom St. Gregory saw and exclaimed, Not angels, but angels, youngest of all is he of the men who came in the Mayflower. Suddenly breaking the silence, the diligent scribe interrupting, spake in the pride of his heart, Miles Standish, the captain of Plymouth. Look at these arms, he said, the warlike weapons that hang here. Burnished and bright and clean as far as the parade or inspection. This is the sword of Damascus I fought with in Flanders. This breastplate, well, I remember the day once saved my life in a skirmish. Here in front of you can see the very dint of the bullet. Fired point blank at my heart by a Spanish arcebucoro. But it had been of sheer steel, the forgotten bones of Miles Standish. Would at this moment he mold in their grave in the Flemish morasses? Thereupon answered John Alden, but looked not upon from his writing. Truly the breath of the Lord hath slackened the speed of the bullet. Ye in his mercy preserved you to be our shield and our weapon. Still the captain continued unheeding the words of the stripling. See how bright they are burnished as if in an arsenal hanging. That is because I have done it myself and not left it to others. Serve yourself, you would be well served as an excellent adage. So I take care of my arms as you of your pens and your inkhorn. Then too, there are my soldiers, my great Invincible army, twelve men all equipped, having each rest and his matchlock, eighteen shillings a month, together with diet and pillage. And like Caesar, I know the name of each of my soldiers. This he said with a smile that danced in his eyes as the sunbeams dance on the waves of the sea and vanish again in a moment. Alden laughed as he wrote. And still the captain continued, Look, you can see from this window my brazen howitzer planted. I on the roof of the church, a preacher who speaks to the purpose, steady, straightforward, and strong, with irresistible logic, orthodox, flashing conviction right into the hearts of the heathen. Now we are ready, I think, for any assault of the Indians. Let them come if they like, and the sooner they try it, the better. Let them come if they like, but it Sagamore, Sachem, or Powwow, Aspinet, Sam, Somerset, Carbitant, Squanto, or Tukhamanon. Long at the window he stood and wistfully glazed at the landscape, washed with the gray, cold gray mist, the vapory breath of the east wind. 
forested meadow and hill, in the still blue rim of the ocean, lying silently and sad, in the afternoon shadows and sunshine over his continents flitted, a shadow like those on the landscape. Gloom intermingled with light, and his voice was subdued with emotion. Tenderness, pity, regret, as after a pause he proceeded. Yonder there on the hill by the sea lies buried Rose Standish, beautiful rose of love that bloomed for me by the wayside. She was the first to die of all who came to the Mayflower. Green above her is her growing the field of wheat we have sown there. Better to hide from the Indian scouts the graves of our people, lest they should count them and see how many already have perished. Sadly, his face averted, and strode up and down, and it was thoughtful. Fixed to the opposite wall was a shelf of books, and among them, prominent three, distinguished alike for bulk and for binding, Barabas' artillery guide and the commentaries of Caesar, out of the Latin translated by Arthur Gold in English of London, and as if guarded by these, between them was standing the Bible. Musing a moment before them, Miles Standish paused as if doubtful which of the three he should choose for his consolation and comfort. Whether the wars of the Hebrews, the famous campaigns of the, the Romans, or the artillery pieces designed for belligerent Christians, Finally, down from its shelf, he dragged the ponderous Roman, seated himself at the window and opened the book and in silence, turned over the well-worn leaves with thumb marks thick on the margin. Like the trample of feet, he claimed the battle was hottest. Nothing was heard in the room but the hurrying pen and the strike knife. Busily writing epistles important to go by the Mayflower, Ready to sail on the morrow, or the next day at latest, God willing. Homeward bound with the tidings of all the terrible winter, letters written by Alden, and full of the name of Priscilla, full of the name and the fame of the Puritan maiden Priscilla.